Hi, it's Mr. Anderson and this is Chemistry Essentials video 63. It's on the reaction quotient. One of my favorite games when I was a little kid was hide and seek. But lots of times at the end you'd have one person who's still hidden and the person who's searching for him can't find him. And so we would always play a game called hotter or colder. As they get closer you would say you're getting warmer, you're getting hotter, and as you're moving away you're getting colder. And that'd be an easy way for them to find that last person. And so in a reversible reaction we have something similar. And so we identify K as the equ equilibrium constant which is going to be a ratio of products to reactants in a reversible reaction. But that only occurs when we reach equilibrium, when we find what we're looking for. But in science we have a reaction quotient Q which is going to be the same thing. It's calculated in the same way. But it's where we are before we actually reach equilibrium. So it allows us to see how far we are away. It's like playing hotter or colder. And so in a reversible reaction the reactants become products, products become reactants, and over time they eventually reach equilibrium. And when we reach equilibrium we can calculate the equilibrium constant which is simply K equal to the concentration of products divided by the concentration of the reactants. But along that pathway we could also calculate Q which is going to be the concentration of products to reactants at any given time. And over time Q is going to approach and eventually become K once we reach equilibrium. And so a, a model kind of works like this. Imagine if we have a free energy diagram and this ball is going to roll back and forth but let's say it eventually stops right here. At the bottom is going to be K and where it's at now would be Q so we know that it's going to move towards the left. If we let it roll a little bit more it eventually pauses. Now we have a new Q. Now we know that it's going to move right and eventually it's going to reach K or that equilibrium. And so if we use an energy diagram like this K is going to be right here and Q is going to be any way along that path. And so here I've got a model which is essentially a reversible reaction model. On the left side we've got a bunch of molecules. We'll call them A and as they bounce over to the right side they become B. And so what I'm doing is simply keeping track of the number of reactants and products. Reactants are going to be green and products are going to be red and I'm keeping track of that every 50 seconds. And you can see that it varies at the beginning. At the beginning you can see here that we had 100 reactants and zero products but right now as we get 350 seconds in it's starting to stabilize and so I could gather data in a model kind of like that. Now I'm going to take this data and I'm going to graph it and we're going to have a graph that looks like this. So at the beginning we have all reactants and zero products but you can see over time it's eventually reaching this equilibrium. And so let's say that at the end we reach equilibrium and again this is simply a model but how would we calculate that equilibrium constant? It's simply going to be the concentration of products divided by the concentration of reactants. And so if I were to calculate that our products is 65 and our reactants is 35 and so let's say K is 1.9. And so at the end when it reaches equilibrium we'll say that our K value is going to be 1.9. Well what's Q? Q is going to be values along the way before we reach equilibrium. And so what's going to be our Q at that first point? It's going to be zero. How did I calculate that? I simply took the number of products which is zero divided by the reactants which is 100 and that's going to give me a Q value of zero. Now if I go to the next one, so if I go to 50, how am I going to figure that out? It's going to be my products which are 0.42 divided by 0.58 and so that's going to be 0.72. And now let's watch what happens to our Q value as we move closer and closer to equilibrium. You can see it stabilizes here but I simply don't have enough products. It's lower than that. Now I overshoot it and my Q value goes a little bit too high and then it eventually approaches it and it eventually becomes K. Q and K are exactly the same thing. And so this is a model but it shows you what's going on in a chemical reaction. K is what we have at the end is Q and Q is what we have along the way. And so if we were to summarize a little bit in a reversible reaction if my Q value is less than my K value the reaction has to move to the right. What does that mean move to the right? I have to convert more of my reactants into products. What happens if my Q value is greater than my K value? Then I have to move to the left. And what do I have when my Q value equals my K value? I'm at equilibrium or they're going to be the same ratio. Now it's sometimes hard to remember this and so if you put it on a number line it helps you quite a bit. If I put my Q and my K values on a number line like this so K is where I want to be and Q is where I am which way am I going to have to move along this number line? I'm going to have to move from the right to the left. So I'm going to have to move left. I'm going to have to convert more of my products into reactants so I can eventually reach K. Now this only works in a homogeneous kind of a state. In other words, if we were to look at liquids, if we were to look at liquids and solids or gases to solids or gases to liquids, 
this reaction quotient is not going to work. Now if we apply it to an actual chemical reaction, I've got this reversible reaction up here, two moles of these makes one mole of this and two moles of this, I can use what's called an ice table to look at the initial concentrations and then my final concentrations at equilibrium. Why do they call it an ice table? Well you can see here that I have my initial concentrations, my equilibrium at the end, and then I have my change, or I have my ICE. And this is going to be measured in molarity. And so if we were to calculate what my Q value is right here. Here's my Q value right here. Well, you can see that since I have no products at this point, my Q is going to be equal to zero. Now, how do I figure out my K value? If I'm given my, my concentrations at equilibrium, I could calculate K. Now, I'm going to show you how to do that in the next video on equilibrium, but let's just say it is 650. And again, watch the next video on equilibrium if you don't know how to do that. So what, which way is this reaction going to move? Is it going to move to the right? Is it going to move towards the left? Well, you can see if I put them on a number line, if I put K on a number line and Q on a number line, I have to move to the right which should make total sense. I have to convert these reactants to products if I'm ever going to approach equilibrium. So it's going to move towards the right. And so if I were to show you what those values are going to be, so how did I get these values? If I take this number, subtract that, I'm going to get this value right here. You should start to see a pattern in that change row. And so if I look at it, all of these values are going to be the same molarity change. Well, why is that the same molarity change? It's because we have the same moles up here. If we look at this one, it's 0 0.019. Why is that? There's going to only, only be one mole right there. And so stoichiometry is incredibly important. We have to make sure that that change matches the stoichiometry of our equation. And so did you learn to determine the effect of chemical reaction manipulation on Q and K values? I hope so, and I hope that was helpful.